So hey everyone, we're gonna can some meat today. pretty nice uh, meal with that and then I've got a chuck pot roast and what I'm going to do with all of these except for this one I'm going to chop them all up into little pieces some of them are going to be made so that the pets could eat them if they needed to kind of like canned dog food or maybe cat food so basically I'll put some with garlic and onions and some with just the uh, potatoes and carrots and the meat Let's get canning. It has just put in our pork loin roast, which is those big pieces. Um, they're gonna each, you know, be a nice uh, helping of roast for somebody. And you can see they're being put in this water. The water's just kind of being put to simmer. That's on four, which this this eye is like a not not exactly medium heat. And it's because I'm going to do a hot pack. That means the jars are going to be warm, which those are on two, 200 is the highest that this stove or the lowest the stove can go. Now this one is a bone in, so Ed's going to have a little bit of extra work. And this one was about $10 less than this one, which is boneless it's the same type of roast same manufacturer I say manufacturer it probably is manufactured the same um, company that distributed it How now he's gonna um, cut these into stew sizes I like the way you're handling that meat Ed. look at that layer of fat right there in the middle you can tell that's a butt roast that pig had a lot of butt so anyway, while we're waiting, Ed's got some carrots chopped up and some onions chopped. The onions are not going to go in the one that will designate safe for pets. And I'm not really going to call it dog food because honestly, it's all edible for human consumption. If we need it. Yeah, if we need it. So what I've got here is, well I actually have black pepper over there and I've got bouillon in these two containers because I am going to use beef bouillon. Now if you get flavored bouillon and it's not like from beef stock, I would encourage you to look and make sure that you don't have like iodized salt in it. I mean it's not that it's going to be bad, it's just going to have kind of an off taste. And then salt. And the salt is not for preservation, the salt is um, just for the extra flavor. So if you use salt, use not none iodized salt. Is that a good size? Smaller. Smaller. Like half? Yeah, about half of that. Okay, what am I doing with them? Put them in the pot. I ain't walking every piece over there. He ain't walking every piece over there. Anyway, yeah, the salt use salt that's not iodized or you can use what they call pickling not pickling but yeah salt for canning is what some of it's called depending on what aisle in the grocery store you get it on but use the salt that does not have the iodine in it non-iodized salt i'm also going to use garlic powder and onion powder in the ones that aren't going to be marked safe for pets and those potatoes over there are also going to be in it and they'll be in the ones that are safe for pets and are not and then there'll be some I'm just going to put straight up meat in it and nothing else other than the seasonings because you know why not my jars are warm 
and I actually have a whole bunch more of them that I, I haven't pulled out of the oven yet, but I'm starting slowly just so I can uh, show you guys this and I'm gonna actually turn the thing off because I'm just going to be spending my time filling it up, basically. So, I've got my pan which has warmed up my meat pieces so that I'm not going to be shocking my jars that are nice and warm. Saves a little bit of time in it. This is going to be the, you know what, I should probably do the dog safe first. That way I'll know what I've got on the bottom of the, the canner. So I'll do my dog safe, pet safe food first. And that's the food without the onion and without the garlic. So no onion powder and no garlic powder either. Just this bouillon, pepper, and I am going to add some salt. And that's pretty much the seasoning. You're just going, going to, uh, you know, probably get a little bit of this on the rims and you're going to take a towel with a little bit of vinegar on it and just wipe the rims off. One teaspoon. I mean, you could use more if you want to of the, the bouillon for, you know, your pet safe stuff if you want to or even your own taste preferences. Just know that um, if it's sitting on your shelf and you see a little brown, you know, powdery mix at the bottom, it's not your food falling apart. It's just, you know, eventually the seasonings will settle to the bottom. And that was one tablespoon of that. Now, because this is pet safe, I'm not going to put as much black pepper, just a half a teaspoon. And you think that might be too much, but the longer that you let this sit on the shelf, the less potent it's gonna taste. So we're just gonna assume that it's gonna be on the shelf for 10 years. <laughs> 10 years might seem like a long time, but believe me, uh, you can it right, you rotate your stock right, and you can have stuff that lasts a long time. That's the point, is to have it last a long time. The texture might be a little bit off, but it's gonna still be good. Now remember the salt, I'm just going to put a half a teaspoon also. You don't have to have salt at all. Salt is not what preserves this stuff. The pressurized canning is what preserves it. Salt is just for flavor. Some people, you know, start off canning thinking that or they're afraid of canning because they're like, I don't wanna have to oversalt everything. This ain't your grandma's canning. Grandma didn't have pressure canning. Grand Grandma had pressure until <laughs> it explode. <laughs> That's what Grandma had. Blowing up the house. Exactly, blowing up the house. All right, so th because this is my pet safe, then I'm going to use the smaller carrots. I'm saving the coarse chopped carrots for my bigger chunk of roast. A preference as to how many how many carrots you put in. I like to cover it up at the bottom, make it kind of a layer. If you don't touch the rim, that's fine. Some people use the funnel and some don't. Like never use the funnel, and that's fine too. You just have a lot more to clean up. That almost fell over. And this towel is here, um, not because I just, you know, make a mess or whatever, but you'll see when the jars come out, they need somewhere to stay that they don't ruin the, the finish. And this is not a wood table, it's that weird stuff that looks like contact paper. What do you call that, Ian? The laminate or something like that on top of this table? Who? For mica? So I've got, you know, carrots and yes, they're dogs, but they would eat potatoes. And if the dogs don't get them, we can eat potatoes. 
and you see I'm not using the funnel because I don't want to make people think I don't have all the necessary equipment. There's only a little bit of equipment you have to have. Right in. The rest is just convenience. And I don't know why I'm doing that, because I'm just going to turn around and dip right into here and pull out <laughs> water to cover it. Even though it, um, with this much meat and the way that the carrots will pull, uh, cook down a little bit, I'm not really going to need um, that much liquid. But I'm, um, some people prefer to make a separate a batch of broth or boiled water and use that because this water has a little bit of fat floating around in it from where the meat's been breaking down in the heat of that fat. If it's already coming off and yeah it's kind of hot. That's kind of hot. That's tough to come off. It won't be tough to eat by the time you actually get to it though. Fine. All right, so this is what my jars look like. This one doesn't have as much meat in it. I might need to put one or two more pieces in to fill it up to the, the little fill line. I don't know how that shifted. Um, now, at this point, if you're gonna put water or broth in it, you go ahead and do that. And if I was going to do that, I'd make sure that I pushed all the air bubbles out, but because I'm not filling it up with water or broth, not this one, I am gonna do the other one, then I would do that, and if that's the case, you go ahead and do that before you put the, the vinegar around the rims, which I'm gonna do next. So I just poured my vinegar, just a couple of, you know, little do to do on this towel here. do to do is an official measurement. Then I'm just going to take that and wipe around the rim in case I got any fat and drippings or whatever on them. You do this to all your rims. If it was like fruit or sugar or something like that, honestly, I'd just use water, but because it's meat and it's got fat that could potentially pop a seal or make it not seal properly, I'd rather just, you know, caution. Also, you notice I'm not soaking my rims. These are, are new and they've been clean, but they're not soaked. So if it makes you more comfortable, you can go ahead, but the manufacturer says that these don't need to be. If I was reusing them, I would soak them just to get them, you know, prepped and ready to seal. But yeah, I've used them a whole lot without soaking them. I haven't had a problem, but you do what makes you feel comfortable. I'm just gonna finish this up. Screw this on hand tight. And yeah, I can do it with one hand. <laughs> I'm going to double check them as I put them in the canner, just in case. Right now my water is filled to the recommended setting for my manufacturer, which I have the All-American 921. So my water's filled up to about, I guess this is probably a sixth, maybe a seventh of the way. It's about an inch and a half of water. Now I'm putting these in there slowly, even though my jars were warmed properly. But I don't want to take the chance of popping an air bubble out of the canner and having hot water pop on me. Now to keep my pet safe where I know where it is and what it is, to keep that safe from mis misplacing uh, it or confusing it with the kind that has onion and garlic in it, 
I'm going to leave that on the bottom level and I'm just going to place my handy dandy separator on top. And now I'm going to do the same procedure again with the next round of jars. Only what I'm going to do is add onion and garlic in with the carrots and the potatoes. Alright, so I have all my cans now in there. They are double stacked because that is the type of canner. I if you have a dial gauge and you don't have a weighted gauge to put um, on your lid, then what you're going to do is uh, use the 11 PSI. This is pints that I'm doing and I'm below 1,000 square, uh, 1,000 feet in altitude and if you have a weighted gauge you can use 10 PSI which is pressure per square inch and um, it's important to get your altitude right because that determines how much pressure that you need to safely cook your food inside these jars. So I wouldn't skimp on researching where my altitude is. Mine happens to be below a thousand square feet or a thousand. You know, you know where I am. Okay. I like putting square in it. <laughs> I know. I, I know I like putting square in it. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and close my lid, lock it up, and then I'm going to turn my heat up to high so we can get this pressure going. And I'm not going to start my timer, which will be, since I've got pint jars, 90 minutes if you have quarts, 75 for my pints. All right, so I got my eye turned up, and right now I'm at zero pressure because it hadn't started yet. But when it does um, get to the 10 for me up here, can you see that? When it gets to the 10, that's when I'm going to start my timer, and that's when I'm going to put this weighted gauge on, and I'm going to put it on 10 pounds of pressure. All right, so we're back, and I don't know if you can see it. You can see little bits of steam there. So it's starting to steam. Um, I don't have a, a rise in pressure just yet, so we're just gonna leave that weighted gauge off a little bit longer. So my gauge is moved up enough. I've had enough venting done so now I'm going to get my weighted gauge and I'm going to make sure that it says 10 before I put it on there and again I have pints so since I have pints I'm making sure that once I get to that 10 right there and if you have a gauge and you don't have the the weighted gauge just use your dial gauge and go to 11 instead of 10 but because I have a weighted gauge I'm doing 10 and once it gets there, I'm going to try to keep keep it right there at the 10. For sure, I don't want it to get to 15 and overcook my food. So, and if you're above a thousand in altitude, then you need to go to the 15. Still 75 minutes for either one. Don't start your timer though until you get to 10. It's going up and there's still peace and quiet right now. That's going to change. I'll leave you a link to Ed's channel. Ed does some pretty neat stuff too. Sometimes. It's still pretty quiet. It's almost to 10. And you're going to hear that, and that's usually the sign that the pressure is getting higher than what's on the weighted gauge. So anytime it gets right at 10 and a little bit over, I'm going to hear the, the weighted gauge banging around because the steam's trying to literally come out, and it's keeping it pressurized. That's another reason why you don't take your weighted gauge off until it hits completely zero PSI. You don't want to lose pressure too fast inside the canner. That's the sound that lets me know that I'm right there at the edge. Now, occasional clink clank and hissing, that's, that's normal, that's okay. 
abnormal and I have to adjust my heat, which I will have to in a second, would be constant clanking and it won't stop. Alright, we're at 10 now and I'm going to go ahead and start my timer for 75 minutes. So I now have um, just shy of 39 minutes left. We're maintaining our 10 PSI, keeping our weighted gauge happy. That's the bail. 75 minutes and turn this off we're just gonna have to wait until it goes down on its own and that's usually not very long I would say it'll hit zero in about 10 minutes it might take 15 sometimes the ambient temperature in the room which is uh, 70 degrees in the room sometimes that'll make it where it goes a little bit you know faster or slower that's also something to consider if you have like the air conditioner on when you're cooking it's going to change the temperature so you're gonna like turn your eye on a lot higher than, than I am right now um, what you don't want to do is fan your cooker and have it cool off too fast we are almost at zero and I can hear a little bit of bubbling in there. It's still going to be uh, fizzing and bubbling when it uh, comes out of the canner. And it's starting to smell good. I can smell the contents. I'm going to take my weighted gauge off first and let it vent. And you see I'm, I've got like a paper towel or use an oven mitt or whatever. This is going to be very hot, so I don't want to, to touch it. You hear that? That's pressurized steam coming out. I don't know if you can see it. Um, I actually can't see it, although I do see water. And if I was really brave, I'd like hold my hand over it, but that'd just be kind of foolish. All right, I no longer hear the steam venting. And I'm going to open my canner and because I have an All-American, then I have these little safety thingies here. So we're gonna open them opposite ends, one here, one here. That's how I open it. And if they're hot, use a um, pot holder or paper towel folded together so you don't burn your fingers. It's all bubbly, bubbly, bubbly in there. Now you can let this sit in there and stay in the temperature if you want to, stay in the heat. Or you can get your little jar grabbers and start moving it. Usually don't look at the temperature. I usually look at how cold it is out here. And if it's too cold out here and I don't want my temperature to drop too fast. That's basically what it is. I don't want the temperature on the jars to drop too fast because I don't want to crack my jars. All right, so get my jar grabbers. That is still bubbling. It smells good.
off to cover a lot of it so it'll just stick out of there. Nothing broke, nothing cracked, nothing leaked out the top. <laughs>